Sister Anthony, God bless you. Come on in the room and just put a praise on that prayer this morning. Put that praise. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Almighty, hallelujah. We're going to the word now. Hallelujah to get hear what the Lord has to say to us this morning. I just want to encourage us again that as the word is being going is going forth to just put a hold of you on your prayer request and just listen to what you know, God is saying to us in this end time, God, God is speaking to us because his coming is near and he wants us to be saved. It don't make any sense. We come and we get parakets in and we get this and get that and get the whole world and his wife. And our soul is lost in hell for eternity. Glory to God. So I would implore you, glory to God, put all on the parakets and sit and listen. Because sometimes when we are typing, we're not even hearing what God is saying and Satan put a block on our ears, we're not here. We can say yes, sometimes we can multitask, but there are times Satan will put a block, we're not even hearing what the word of God is saying to us. Glory to God Almighty. So put a hold on all prayer requests this morning and listen to what God is saying to us this morning. Above all else, we must be saved. God bless you all. God bless prophet, you prophetess and kingdom workers, co-hosts, and everyone online, all participants here on Zoom and YouTube. And I hand over to Elders Alan Russell, our Elder David Edwards. I'm not sure who's going to take the lead this morning, but God bless you, sirs. God bless you. Elder Russell, Elder Edwards, not sure who's come on in. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Are yes. you hearing me? So, Lord, yes, sir. We're hearing you. Glory. I, I, for some reason, I couldn't turn on my um my um my mic um and um and even my camera Glory to God. Praise did you God. change your device sir <laughs> no what happened i um kicked myself off and then oh. the and then it was like <laughs> trying to get my but that is good amen the devil is a liar this morning and we thank God for his goodness and his mercy. We are here one more week. A good morning to you and praise the Lord, Sister Wilson. God bless you. Amen. Praise God. We just want to thank God for giving us one more week that we are here. We have made it. We have overcome. We are here. Amen. Praise God. And we can put it in the atmosphere and declare that this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and I will be glad in it. If you notice that the last phrase, I will, you're going to will yourself to be glad this day. I know things are depress depressing around you. I know you might have issues and you might have your problems and everything is going on. You know, there's so much happening, but you're going to will today that I will rejoice. You're not going to lose your praise. You're not going to lose your thanks to God. You're not going to lose your hallelujah. Because I will rejoice and be glad in it. Because God has given us mercy. God has given us his grace and his grant, his favor to us. What a wonderful God. And instead of looking at all the bad things, just look to God. Look to Jesus. Because he is the one. He is our joy. He is our expectation. He is our everything. And if we can turn our eyes on Jesus, there, there are things that are happening in my life, but I just turn my eyes on Jesus. Hallelujah. And I'm sure there are things that are happening in your life, but I will rejoice. You will it. Will yourself to say hallelujah. Will yourself to say praise God. David said his praise shall continually be in my mouth because though he slay me i'm going to trust him so i thank god for his mercy this morning and i greet the spirit of the lord on this platform amen i just want to give honor amen to prophetess angela moulton amen praise god god bless the woman of god and thank you for giving us this platform and this privilege to speak to your people amen praise god because god is good 
Amen. Praise God. And we don't, you know, I, and I can say on behalf of Ella Edwards that we are very humble. Amen. Praise God. To speaking um, by the Holy Ghost to you. Amen. And everyone that comes on the line, we are very humble that, you know, we can be used of God the way he used us. Amen. Praise God on this platform. So we thank you for giving us this opportunity. We don't take it lightly. Amen. Praise God. Bless you, woman of God, Angela Stoddart. Amen. Evangelist Stoddart and amen. All our bishops and all our pastors that are on the line. My pastoral friends, my bishop friends that are listening. God bless you. Amen. Praise God. My sister. Amen. My brothers and sisters in the Lord and even my flesh sister that is listening as well to Stadanian. Give me a shout out right now in the name of Jesus. God bless you all. And we thank God for one more morning that he has brought us to this time. And as we have been looking um, and feasting, I should say, we have been feasting on the word. You know, I have been, I don't know about anybody, but I've been feasting on the word and I've been strengthened by the prayers and by the, um, the exhortation and by the instruction that has been given. My life, amen, praise God, has been better for it. My spiritual life has been better for it. And as we've been feasting on the word, looking at these dispositions, called the seven deadly sins <clears throat> which none of us can say that you know you know we are you know we are all on top of it you know we, we we reach we are there you know because we're still in the trenches we're still fighting the good fight of faith and so as we've been feasting on all of the um on the word and the instruction that um that has been given to us we want to know this morning, look at them and praise God. And, and, I, and I know that, that there might be some clinicians on the line and, you know, people who work, we call it in the helping field. But as we look at these things and some of these sins, you know, pride and loss and gluttony and, and slothful and, 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 um, and wrath and, and all of these seven deadly sins, as we we look at it, some of these some of these dispositions have a stronghold in our spirit. There are some that have, have we, we talk about it on Saturday that that there are some that have it at a clinical level. It it reach you know it reach that level where it it it, it it's no longer a run of the mill kind of thing that you know is something that you can take charge of, but it it eat right into your to the very fabric of your spirit and you just can't let it go and some people will look at you and say you don't have the capacity to let it go because it is so in, in grace, it, um itself in in your in your life in your psyche in your thinking amen praise god in your spirit it is so ingratiated there that you and this you and the desire is one you know, you and the loss has now become one. You know, you and the, the anger has become one. So when people see you, they don't see Brother Russell, they see anger coming. You know, if you don't understand what I'm saying. It reached that point now. And so we, you know, we we have to now start to work on ourselves and to try to get to that better version of ourselves now. And it's going to take prayer and fasting as we work through this disposition of 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 um of 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 loss and you know and and in when we talk about loss we look at it as excessive desires uh when we talk about pride amen praise god when we talk about um, um anger when we talk about wrath when we talk about uh, slothfulness and gluttony and all of those things when we talk about it we have to now find a way to arrest those things and put it before God. So with discussion with Ella Edwards, we kind of come up with a discussion this morning and we hope that it will be a blessing to you. Praise God. Because one of some of these things that we have experienced and have become a part of us, we are we we have what we call triggers. Amen. Praise God. You know, and it's not only people who have it to a clinical level that that word is used for. You know, because, you know, we can't be triggered by anything. Um, 
we carry these triggers with us. You know, it's it's in our mind. It's in it's you know it's in our spirit. It's like a memory, like something that 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 pulls your 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 psyche, pulls your memory to um, let you see or remember what has happened to you. And for those of us who have reached to that level where uh, we have experiences, you know, those experiences brings about uh, triggers. So as we look at wrath today, as we continue wrapping up anger, we want to look at what will trigger your anger. What triggers you and we talk a little bit about it last week some people mention it as they come on and share you know they will mention some of the things that will cause them to get angry you know um some people mask it but when it's triggered it comes up it just percolate right up to the top and you say jesus i never know that's how he was until something happened and people have different triggers people have different um, things that will 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 cause them to behave differently from what they you they were five minutes ago. So five, some people are like a switch. You switch them off and you switch them on. Something happened and, and it's like a, a switch, boom, and they're gone into another into an, another mindset. You know, um, by the just by a flick of a switch, just by a, a memory. You know, just by seeing something. And some people are triggered by what they smell. You know, if they smell a certain um, um, a scent, you know, they might go somewhere and they smell a certain scent. That becomes a trigger because maybe years ago, while they were um, going through what they have been going through, there was a certain smell in the house. There was a certain smell in the room. There was a certain smell in the office. So, amen, praise God. Just by smelling something can trigger your memory, amen, of something that has happened to you. So your triggers can be different, yeah. And it can be something that you hear, a word that is spoken, that you hear. So on a broad basis, on a broad um, um, understanding, we want to look at some triggers and at what will trigger your wrath and what will trigger your anger because we have to confront these triggers and we have to kill it. So when we come on the line and say, we have to kill a demon, praise God. We are not just talking about, it's not a cliche, right? It's not because the prophet says so or Ella Russell says so. It's true. You have to kill this demon. You have to murder it. Amen. Praise God. You have to put a, the, 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 the Holy Ghost dagger right in his heart and kill those triggers. Amen. Praise God. And sometimes you have to kill it and kill it again. Sometimes you have to go over it again. You have to stomp over all over it again and again and again because something don't go with yourself. It doesn't go, they go away that easy. And so we have to confront this thing. And we remember, I tell you, confrontation is not a bad word. Other people want to tell you that confrontation is a bad word. It is not because you have to confront these things. And we're going to talk about that. So let's look at triggers. Amen, praise God. Let me see my time. And your trick, one of, one of the things that I look at, you know, is that we trigger some people to, to, you know, to be angry. And we are dealing with anger now because we do with pride and everything. So we're just wrapping up this, this anger and wrath. I remember when we talk about wrath, we are talking about um, from the Greek word, which suggests to us that it's not just the run of the mill anger. This anger is red hot anger that will even melt metal. That is what the Greek word is suggesting. That means that mean it is so... It is so um, mild that too, that if, if you don't take it under control, you will continue in, in undesirable behavior. It will cause you to have it undesirable, to behave undesirably before people. It will cause you, amen, praise God, to be offensive. It will cause you to harm people. That's the kind of anger we're talking about. And if you say, well, Ella Russ, my anger to reach right there. So if you have it and you let it fester, it's going to be a problem. So we have to confront it. And one of the triggers that we want to look at when we, when we look at anger or, or wrath is abandonment. Is abandonment. 
that can be a trigger for people. Because when people are, especially children, when they grow up in an abandoned home, in a home where their parents or their caregivers just abandon them, they have nobody to supervise them, nobody to care for them, nobody to look after them. And they grow up having no attachment. When they, when they reach maturity, when they reach age where they have to now start to live their own life, that feeling of being abandoned began, begin to eat them out. And they have no secure attachment because they have attachment issues because they have been abandoned, right? They are not sure if this partner, this person whom they might love come in their life might stay. So they, so they have this, this abandoned uh, mentality. Well, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't think I'm going to be secure in my attachment to this person. So they have relationship issues. You have people right now brothers and sisters in the church right now that have been abandoned and have not dealt with it. Their mother abandoned them, their father, their uncle, some loved one in the formative years while they were growing up, just leave and they are left out there, even, praise God, open to the elements out there. And as a result, their life, not all of them, but most of them, their life did not go the way it ought to go Praise God, because of no supervision in their life and they grow up feeling that they have not accomplished anything and they become angry because mama leave me. They could become angry because daddy leave me. They become angry. And, and whilst it might be, you know, uh, uh, you know, it's understanding that they might feel that way. Some people just hold on to that and don't let it go. And as a, as a result, they have unsecure or at what we call attachment issue. They don't attach themselves to nobody because um, I think they might, um, they might, they might not stick around. They might not stay around. So let me let me have no secure attachment to this person. So you might marry to somebody, and you know something. You know you you leave. You say you know I'm leaving. Even that word I am leaving is a trigger for them because that's the word they hear when their mom was leaving or their dad was leaving them or their caregiver was leaving them. I am leaving. And when you say I am leaving for work, I remember counseling a couple and the man was so angry because she said she, she was leaving. And the, the, the wife said, Ella Russell, I, I told him I was leaving to go to work. And that's what I know. So I asked him, what happened? What happened in your past, sir? And he began to tell me what happened. Oh, well, his mother left him and his father left him, right? And he was scared by, cared for by going from different places, different house to house. Sometimes he was on the street and that's the way he grew up. But he never shared that, right? And when he heard the word, I am leaving, he felt that he was going to be abandoned by his wife. And he became very angry at her and cause a may praise God problem that morning. So abandonment can be a trigger for some people. It can let you feel, um, you bring back that anger um, back into your, into your memory and you get so angry, but at the wrong person. Abandonment. This famous one, it's a trigger. Abuse. You can be, you know, when people are abused verbally, People are abused psychologically and they are abused physically. And God, he knows when people are abused while they are growing up, they tend to have that anger. And that anger ingratiates their very spirit that they perpetrate the same abuse that they get. And that is why we can't allow wrath and anger to fester in our life because as we grow and as it fester we will perpetrate the same abuse on people even on our children that is why i said we have to kill this demon this morning we can't let allow to fester we can't let allow to get over us abuse verbally abuse psychologically emotionally and abuse physically 
And you can't say, Russell, the physical abuse is the worst. So is the emotional abuse. When, when the devil starts to mess with your mind, it's the worst possible thing. When he began to mess with your mind. So people who, who, are, um, who are abused, they say, tend to, to when, when children see abuse, even domestic violence in the home is a problem. Because you might think that the children are not affected by the abuse, and they are. <laughs> that is why in an apostolic home, it should not be there. You should not be hitting on your, on your, on, on your wife. You should not be hitting on your husband. Because the children are looking at it. The children are hearing the argument. They are hearing everything. And they grow up and perpetrate the same thing. Because you may say, Ella Russell, no, because they never see it, but they hear it. And the hear gate is just as strong as the eye gate. They hear the abuse. They hear the scream. They hear the low noise. They hear everything. And the abuse in the home will affect the children. And it affects children in different ways. We just look at it on Saturday, you know, between um, Hamor and, 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 and Israel. When Dina was raped, Right, the both fathers come together and were saying, you know what, let Shike marry uh, Dina and you know, kind of put away the 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 the, the defilement out, out of her out of her, like give her uh, um, let's get married and 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 clean up the thing. And both fathers were agreeing to that, but they did not know how the boys were, how it affect the boys till they kill and Simeon and Levi. Kill all the meal in the city because of their anger. We read it on Saturday. You can go back Genesis chapter 34. And you can read that chapter. You don't know how the abuse is affecting the children. And when you see, when you hear certain word, that will trigger you. You know, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to. I'm going to, I, I, or if you, you do your hand like this, it triggers the abuse. You know, certain action would trigger the abuse. You remember how you were abused. You remember certain words that were speak that trigger the abuse. You remember, amen, praise God, how the person fierce look that would trigger the abuse. And that's why when you're talking to an abused person, you have to choose their word wisely because the wrong, wrong, one wrong word can just trigger them to get angry because they hear that is what their husband said, that is what their wife said. And it triggered that memory and they begin to get angry. And they will be angry because nobody was there to rescue them. They will get angry at different, at different family members because they were not there to take them out. They will get angry at their mom or their dad because they were not there when the abuse in their relationship was going on or when even the parents perpetrate that abuse on their children and they grow up with that fear mentality and even start abusing their kids because let me tell you with sin sin doesn't stay one place it's like 11 it worked through the door it worked through it until it become one with the door and that is why we have to get rid of it rejection you know you grow up being rejected you know um not that around you don't want you are not wanted you are being rejected and because of that you are angry at people of not accepting you even in your own family you're angry at your family member because you call yourself the black sheep of the family they never want you in their company rejection is a trigger for some people to get angry when you are rejected people don't want you around them and even if your friends if you when you, if you grow up and you you have friends and 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 they might not invite you to this little group um this group date you might be left out for whatever reason you get angry because you remember how your family was how you were rejected by your family you know they might have a little get together but you aren't you don't you are not healthy in your relationship to understand you know Ella Russell, people people invite other people. You know, I don't invite Ella Rose to, you know, and that's fine. 
But there are some people who are not fine with that. They feel like my friends are rejecting me because they have their little party over there and they don't remember me. They didn't invite me. You ever, you ever deal with such people yet? You know, that, you know, it, it, if you don't invite them to everything, the one thing that you don't invite me, that is what they get upset over because they are dealing with rejection and they will get angry at you. Some one in one invitation that was not given can cause a friendship to go on the rocks. One invitation. You invite them to everything, but the one that you don't invite them to, that is the one that you were the relationship. Mash it up. Because they have been dealing with rejection. And when you don't invite them, they feel rejected. <laughs> My God of mercy. My God of mercy. And they begin, they become angry at you because they remember the rejection that they faced in their childhood while they were growing up. And, and you not acknowledging them or inviting them becomes an issue for them. And they will become very angry with you. Then we look at stagnation. Because your life has been hijacked and, and, have, been, and have been stagnated. And you see other people going on. You see other people making it. You see other people getting ahead. And your life is just stagnated because of your experiences and of what have happened to you, the unfortunate things that have happened to you. Your life has become stagnated, not going nowhere. But other people, your friends is going away, going, going on, moving on, and you are not moving. That is a trigger for some people. And they will get angry at your accomplishment because their life is not going nowhere. Yes, right? They will get angry at you or your children making headway in life. And they are not go there and their family is not going anywhere. And that stagnation becomes a, 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 a flashpoint for them. Because they think that they are not going anywhere. And you and they see the success on you, they become angry. So stagnation. Comparison trap. You're comparing yourself. I, I think Ella Edwards talked about it um, when he, he, he was talking about pride. You're comparing yourself. You know, you compare yourself with people. You know, you fall into that comparison trap. The Bible said if we compare ourselves, we are not wise. So you can't compare yourself. But when it's, when it's, when it's clinical, you know, when it's like that, it be, you become angry because you compare yourself with your neighbor. You, you're not you're not at the place where you're you're supposed to be. You and the sister start out the same way. You and them graduate from school the same way, the same time, and they go on ahead, and you're still right here. And you begin to compare and say, "But but we both start off together. But oh, she reached so far, and I'm reaching here. I'm just here." And you compare yourself to the brother. You compare yourself to the sister. You come into church and you see the, the God blessing the sister, God blessing the, the, the brother. And instead of you waiting for your blessing because of the anger that you fester in you, you begin to compare yourself. You compare your dress. You compare your shoes. You compare, you know, everything. Compare the suit. Compare the panic. You know, the, even the car. You begin just, just comparing your marriage. You comparing your children. And you fall into that comparison trap. And because what is not what is happening in your neighbor's life is not happening in your life, you become angry. Because while we are growing up, you never get anything good. Hand me down. You know, never get anything good. And so you, you develop this mindset to compare yourself. Fearful. Envy. Uh, resentment and bitterness. Let's talk about resentment and bitterness. Because that way, that those things, things that you you would get bitter over varies in your life, and resentment will vary over your life. People who are resentful or are bitter will feel that life has done an injustice to them. You know, life has wronged them somehow because. They never reach the position they want to reach and they become bitter over it. People see your success and become bitter over it <laughs> because they don't have any success. They didn't have it. They grew up rough 
And it's not everybody who grew up rough come up with this condition, you know. Some people who grew up rough turn it into a weapon. But I'm talking about different persons and trigger, that would trigger your anger, would be the bitterness. And it always go back to your memory. What that person said, what that person has done, what that person has um, spoken in your life. And you become resentful. You become bitter because you are not at the place where you want to be. You become bitter because somebody gets something better than you. So you fall. You become bitter because you are sidelined for a position. You become bitter because the bishop never uh, 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 appoint you, but appoint the other person who just come and you become bitter. <laughs> My God. You're in a church, a self church, long and old, long, you're, 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 you're jumping all the ministry and serve church. And because convocation come and the bishop overlook you for some reason, I don't know, and pick somebody else and you will never get the call. You will come bitter. <laughs> God have mercy. And bitterness can be a trigger because in, in implicit in bitterness, in some of the experience is rejection can cause bitterness. And, and that's why, you know, and let's go back to this idea. And that's why when people are, are going on date or seeking a partner and, and the person might say, you know, I'm not ready for the relationship, might rebuff them, especially the male. If the male feel that he has been rebuffed from a, a sister who he's, he's desiring and the sister says, I'm not ready for it. That can become bitterness for them because envelops in that rejection you rejected me they become bitter over it that triggers to them when they were growing up how they were rejected during their childhood everything that come from your childhood you know most of our experiences is coming from our childhood and that's why sometimes we have to go right back to when we were six as the brother said right back when we were five right back when we were eight years old we have we have to go back to the point of our um to the beginning of our events in our life that will cause us to become the way we are to deal with it from there because if we don't deal with it we're going to still carry it that is why we we, we sing this song take me back there lord to the place i used to be we, we, where we want god to take us back where we can confront the things that have happened to us so that we can kill it right there at the roots and that's why when you're going counseling they go back into your past what has happened to you what the, what what goes on in your past because you have to go back there to deal with it. You have to go back 10 years ago to forgive. You have to go back 11 to 20 years ago to let go some things. Envy. Mm, envy. The envious of the person. We talk about that. Can be a trigger. Jealousy can be a, a trigger for your anger. You're jealous. Right, you are you 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 you're married to to the brother, you're married to the sister, but nobody can talk to them the way you're jealous because I, I, your anger because the person is coming to take them away from me, and that's that's that from your childhood. The person is coming from my husband, the blood of Jesus, and it's just a simple praise the Lord. The brother just say praise the Lord to the sister, the sister just say praise the Lord to the brother. We just greet each other, but it be, you are so you are so. And fleeing with jealous, jealousy that it triggers your anger. And you can't, you will, you will confront the sister and you cause a one big scene in a church because you think that the brother want the sister or the sister want the brother, your, your, your husband or your wife. You saw it work? You saw it work? You see, if you don't deal with anger, how, how it can become embarrassing or it can cause embarrassing situation even in the church. The sister having to stick up our Bible and walk because you can't have no friends because the way oh, you're jealous because it will trigger your wrath, trigger points for your anger. Jealousy is a one bigger, one big trigger point for some people, anger. Jealousy. <laughs> My God, I'm very saying. Unforgiveness. You know, oh, th this audio can preach this as a message. If I throw unforgiveness out there, the whole of, all of us there on YouTube and on Zoom know about unforgiveness. We don't have to be lectured in it. Because if you let unforgiveness fester, it always light a flame to your, to your anger. Because you don't let go what the, what the person has said 
or done to you. You don't let it go. So every time you see the person, just the, the just the, just the very sight of seeing the person, my God of mercy, is you become angry. Just just by even smelling the person, <laughs> you become angry. The sight of the person, you you view that person with this DNA because of unforgiveness. And these are the things in the brethren that you don't have to do what Levi and Simeon do, you know, by committing murder, you know. The, the Bible says we are murderers. You don't, you don't want to classify that as murder, you know. But the Bible see me as a murder, murderer, when I don't forgive, when I don't, when I hate. If you hate your brother, and if you hate your brother, that means there's something that you don't forgive him for. You're a murderer. The Bible said, you are saying, you have to get one gun and shoot somebody for commit murder. God said, no, if you hate your brother, you're a murderer. And that, mur and, that, and that hatred stems from some unforgiveness that you don't forgive the person. Because unforgiveness will lead, lead to hatred. It will lead to hatred, brethren. It will open, sin open other doors, you know. It's not one door you open and you run through it, you know. Sin open seven, ten doors for you for walking. And one of those doors if for unforgiveness is hatred. Hate the person. You hate the person because she get one, him get one nice sister. Married to one night. The marriage is not, you know, it's not like your marriage. So you, you hate on them. You hate on their children, them children pass them common entrance, children them going on, you know, and achieving things and, you know, and, and they're being recognized and all of that. And you just hate. People just, and, and let me say to you, you don't do people anything to hate, you know, to hate, you know. People just come into the room and just hate you. People just come and just don't like your picture them. them. Your children, let me just start. Yeah. People just come in and don't like your children, them. And that's it. Hatred. Traumatic events will deal with your anger. Traumatic events. Rape, we know that. Uh, murder. We know that witnessing an accident, we, um, your family member dying from an accident, and you say, why, why God take that person away from me? And you become angry with God and angry with people. And so every time you hear about that accident, it trigger you and you become angry because you remember the loss. That becomes a, a flashpoint for your anger. And the last one, amen, praise God, is aging. And people who work in nursing homes, I shout out to all of you, People who work in nursing home know about what I'm talking about, aging. You get angry because you're getting old. It's the way of life. You're going to get old, right? You go, you're, you're at 15, you're going to become 20, you're going to become 30, you're going to become 40. And as you age, amen, praise God, the body breaks down. It's a natural form of life. But some people, for them, aging is an issue for them. They get angry, especially when they see young people. <laughs> when they see young people in their prime. But you were once in your prime. But when them see young people in their prime and enjoying themselves and doing it, they, get, they, they, they sit down in the seat and start criticizing the young people. Watch them. Watch, watch them. Yeah. That's angry because they are not young again. And that's why it's find some old people trying to capture. There's a different mindset for that. Trying to capture um, their youth by wearing tank top and, 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 and by wearing tight up jeans. You're old. Where are we tight up jeans for? Come on. You, 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 you're 60. Eh? You're 65. We are doing a tight jeans. Mm? We are doing a tank top. Mm? What are you doing in there? You're aging. You're going up. Why, why, you, you, know, you were once 20. Enjoy your 20. And I, I'm sure you probably have um, enjoy your 20, 20s. Leave the young people. Let them enjoy their 20s and their 30s. Let them enjoy their life too because you were once there. So we're going to get mad about aging. That is the way we are. That is the way we are. the body is. It's going to break down as we get older. You're going to feel aches and pain. And some people, ladies and gentlemen, that is a, a lit point for their anger, especially when they see young people in their prime. So these are the different triggers. Abandonment, abuse, rejection. Stagnation, comparison trap, resentment, envy, jealousy, unforgiveness, traumatic events, whether it's rape, accident, or murder, or aging. These are it. Now, um, and this is where LL is going to help me now. Let's now turn to 
um, ways that you can overcome all of these triggers. It's not the be it all, end it all. It's just our kind of roadmap. You know, we discussed it together. And we kind of feed through the Holy Ghost a roadmap that can help us. But it has to be you. You have to take the initiative. Not me, not Ella Edwards, not prophetess, not the one you start out, not the kingdom workers here. You, 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 you have to take the initiative now and confront it, your triggers, and then start work on it. Um, Ella Edwards, you have your list there. Let's go through it. And you can speak on it. And then I will just follow you. Go ahead. The first one. So just before we go there, can we just stop for a minute? I mean, so much has been said, so much stir has been done. Can we just for a minute, just open the mind to me and, and let's just say, Lord, help me to hold out. Lord, pray this brief prayer. Lord, help me help to me hold to out. out. Help me to hold out. Help us, Lord God. Help me to hold out. Help us to hold out, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Let me the mind for a minute. Let's just ask. Hallelujah. Help us. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. Help me, Lord. Jesus. Help me to hold out. Hallelujah. Everybody come in the room as they say. And let's just say, Lord, Lord, Lord. Help me to hold out. Hold out. Hold out. To hold out a little longer, hold out long enough to be saved. Help me, Lord. Yes, Lord. Help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. Just to hold out. Lord, oh, hallelujah. It's, it's been such a tremendous morning as we try to unwrap the things that has caused us to be where we are in terms of wrath and anger. And uh, we want to understand that God has brought us this moment, this opportunity, this event, because he loves us. He wants us to be transformed. He wants us to change. You know, the Bible tells us in Numbers chapter 22 of a prophet, Balaam was his name. <clears throat> And, 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 and God would have it that he sent a word to Balaam. Balaam sought him and God said, don't do it. Don't go. And in his self, he decided that he wanted to go. And while he was going, brethren, riding with two witnesses, notice that God made sure that there was evidence that somebody else knew about it. He was going with two witnesses along the path, riding on a dumb donkey. And God appeared again to him, trying to restrain him from continuing in that way. The Bible says the donkey, say donkey, the donkey went out into a field just to escape the wrath of God that was about to be outpoured. The donkey went out into a field. So they were on a path. It was a path of destruction because the angel was there with drawn sword. This is a path of destruction. Drawn sword to execute judgment. And the donkey, the dumb animal, led them to a field. And you're in a field this morning. A field of healing. A field of opportunity. A field of peace. A change of mind a new direction. You're in a field. God has brought you this moment in this field. So you can get a new field of business. You can get a new field of life. The donkey led them into a field, brother, Elder Allah. Elder led them into a field. And still, with all of that, the man of God persisted. The child of God, the believer, persisted in carrying on. And the donkey again said the angel, and the donkey would have it that he went into a vineyard with two, two vineyard meat. It was a crossroad. And I believe strongly that this morning's presentation brings us to a crossroad. There's two road before you, two way before you, mm. and you need to make a decision. 
where, what path are you going to go continuously down this path of hurt and destruction? Are you going to go to the opposite direction? And with still having all of that, the Bible said that the, the man still continue. And this time the donkey crushed his feet against the wall, still trying to stop him. Some of you are sick, hurting, have all kinds of sickness and disease that they can't explain, doctor can't explain it. And that's simply because anger, bitterness, and wrath has built up certain disease in your body, caused your organs not to be functioning and Till you don't see the hands of God saying you need to forgive, you need to change, you need to turn around, you need to let it go. You need to walk to another path. Sickness, damage, mm -hmm. slowing of your progress, all of that is happening. And still you are blinded, still you don't see. Even irrational and furious you have become that even a donkey talking to you and saying back. That's what the rage and wrath and anger will do. You become irrational, you become insensitive, you become, you, you become as it were, dumb, dumb. Because even when a, a dumb, dumb donkey saying to you, 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 you don't think I, I deserve a little respect, considering that I carry you all these years, and if I'm stopping, don't you think it's for a reason? Well, I stop by to tell you before I go any further that God is talking to you and I this morning. Because the Bible said, the Lord opened Balaam's eyes. He saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with draw, sword drawn in his hand. Mm. Sword drawn in his hand. Mm -mm. And God has an angel dispatched this morning to cut and to heal. Mm. And if you don't want to be cut and healed, then he's going to destroy. Mm -hmm. A knife in a doctor's hand and a knife in a murderer's hand. Same knife. But one will heal and one will hurt. The angel will come to break us as he is breaking us now. Mm. Not for our destruction, but for our healing. As long as you have that pus, that feet festering, it cannot be healed. I practically remember I had a, a cut at my knees and, and I ignored it and it, it started to fester. You know what we talk, fester, the pus. And that's how some people's relationship have become so pussy, so smelly, so bad, and it's deteriorating. And I remember my aunts held me and they rubbed that scab and that pus and that everything off till it bleed. And when it started to bleed, then they put on the dressing. And that dressing, I still have the mark on my knee where that cut was, but that dressing has healed the wound. And so we need to come this morning before God and do the first step. Thank you, Jesus. In the process, practical approach to recovery, and that is to acknowledge that we have a problem. You have to acknowledge that I have a sore, I have a pain, I have something that's eating me up, I have something that's killing me, I have something that is going to lead me to the lake of fire. Acknowledge number one, acknowledge we have an anger and a rat problem. David says in Psalm 51, verse three, for I acknowledge my transgressions mm. and my sin is ever before me. Mm. When Balaam realized that he was at the point of death and destruction and the last warning, he said in verse 34 of Numbers 22, I have sinned for I did not realize <laughs> that you were standing in the road to confront me and now if it this if it please this pleases in your sight I will go back home you decide find another side to turn around acknowledgement with an intent to turn around 
they turn around, to change it, to reverse the process, to start again, to start anew. Acknowledgement. Number two, confess. Open your mouth. The Bible says with the mouth confession is made unto repentance. Open your mouth, confess it in the atmosphere. I am wicked. I am wrathful. I am angry. I need confess your faults, the Bible also say. What? One to another. Because sometimes it's not just enough for us to confess it to God. We need to say it to the person who we have offended. I have done you wrong. I am trying to make a change. I am going to stop doing this. Cease. The Bible says cease. You just send to make a cease and second. Seek from anger. You have to stop. You have to stop. If you don't stop, it's going to kill you. And forsake wrath. Psalm 37. Cease from hunger and forsake wrath. Because if you continue in wrath, verse 8 says in the New International ver Version, cease from anger and forsake wrath. Stop being angry. Stop. Stop being angry. Turn from your rage. Do not lose your temper. It only leads to harm. It only leads to harm. Acknowledge that it's a problem. Confess it. Open your mouth. Declare it to God. Declare it to man. Make sure you understand that this is a spirit that needs to be broken. This is a spirit that need to be broken. What do you mean? It means that you have allowed some demonic influence to be driving your behavior, your attitude, your mind. And unless you confess that and denounce it in the name of Jesus, then it's going to be continuous. Mm. Number three, pray, 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 pray. Fast and pray, fast and pray, fast and pray, fast and pray, fast and pray. Fast and pray. As we break the will of the flesh, we break the desire, we break the passion of the flesh. We say to the flesh, I am your master. You're not my master. I am your master. David says in the Psalm, when thou steadest seeking my face, my heart said unto thee, thy face, Lord, will I seek. Hide not thy face far from me. Put not away thy servant in anger. Thou has been my help. Believe me not. Neither forsake me. Pray, pray, pray to the God who says, if you will come, he is going to listen. He is going to listen. If you come, he will listen. If we confess it, our sins is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. You're going to pray to our brethren. And on a one time, you're going to pray. You're going to pray morning. You're going to pray in the evening. You're going to pray at midnight. Every time you feel the trigger coming on, rather than burst out, say a scripture. Memorize a scripture to deal with that anger. And anytime it comes, just repeat a scripture. Every, whenever I'm afraid, I will trust in the Lord. I will say, if the Lord is my refuge and my fortune, my God and him will I trust. Though my father and my mother forsake me, yet the Lord would find a scripture that supports the earth that you are having and make sure when that trigger comes on, repeat it, repeat it, repeat it, repeat it, repeat it until it becomes you. The preacher said earlier, Elder Russ said that you, you, the, 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 the anger has become you. You has become the anger because of how you have allowed it to take you over in the same way that the word of God you will become the word of God. I will not be afraid. I will walk. I will do what he says. And, and you become more like Christ as you allow the fruit of the spirit to take preeminence. Because remember the fruit of the spirit don't just happen. It is born through trials. It is when you are tried to love, then you know if love is prevalent in your life. It is when you are tried to suffer long that you know if long suffering is operating in your life. Number four, to render to Jesus. The songman says what? All to Jesus. 
I surrender. All to him I freely give. I will ever trust him. I will ever serve him. And, 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 and the song, I think it was Andre Trout who said, if he is the Lord of all, or one of those singers, if he is the Lord of all, he's the Lord at all. Can I repeat that? If he is not Lord of all, he is not Lord at all. So we need to surrender every area of our life. There are some section, a men do a great job of section, sectionalizing our lives. So we have a department that we, we um, think about our marriage and a department for the wife, a department for the work, and, and we can just shut down one department and switch to the other department. But if God is not the Lord of each of those apartments, sections of our life, then he's not Lord at all. So some, some beloved brethren, they, they have a patriot prayer. They can pray from now until tomorrow. But the door to anger is still open. The door to wrath is still open. The door to pride is still open. So, so, so we, we have mastered some error but there are still areas that we have allowed the enemy to take foothold. And the Bible said, don't let the enemy take any foothold because I promise you, if he get a little foothold, he's going to make a whole climb and he's going to move it. Don't let the enemy get a foothold in your life and anger will let the enemy get a foothold in your life. You have to kill that attitude by prayer, submission, deciding to have a change. Surrender totally to God. Number five, get help, brethren, get help. I submit that you can look to God. Psalm 121 verse one says, I will lift up mine eyes onto the hills from whence cometh my help. And the help don't come from the hills, but the help coming from the Lord. You look to the hills, it's not there. You look to the hills as, as, as a source, but it's not there. The hills of Zion are there for worship, but your help cometh from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. So we look to God for help, but Proverbs 11 verse 4 say, where no counselor is, the people fall, but in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. There comes a time when we have to take it also into the realm of seeking advice, godly advice, godly counsel, godly counsel as to how I'm going to deal with this. And if it's a place where you feel that now this is beyond me, I can't control it, uh, I'm clinically sick in this area, you might need to go even further in seeking medical or psychological help to break some of those things. Because I know, Ella Russell, we're here talking and some people are hearing everything that we're saying and they agree with everything we're saying, but how to break away, how to break away from the trigger, how to break away, even in this practical example, I can't do it. And so they might need to sit with somebody who can now clinically look at how the approach they can take to gradually move into these processes that we're saying. Get some help, Britain. Don't stay there and die. Get some help. Get some help. A man outside the gate, outside the city, them lepers say, you know, why stay we here and die? I mean, if we're going to the city and get help, we'll be all right. And if we don't, if we if we stay, we're gonna die. If we're going to the city, we're gonna die. So I'm gonna get help. I'm not gonna stay here and die. And you know the tremendous story that when they decided not to stay where they are, when they decided that they're going to uh, take a chance, when they decided that they're going to move in a progressive way, the armies, their feet became like mighty armies against the, 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 the enemy. The enemy, the Syrian enemy heard a whole army of Israel coming, run, leave everything to give them. And food was now available one more time. Your help come from God. But there are times that you have to also secure some human support. I always recommend an accountable partner, somebody who 
you can work this thing out with them. You know, today I almost, I, I, I went bad and you're able just to, to flesh it out, flesh it out with them, that accountable partner. And, 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 and you hold yourself accountable to them and they hold you accountable to them so that that can help you along the way. Renounce the foothold, number six. Renounce the foothold that you gave to the devil. Renounce it. Tell the devil that said it stop right here. It's not going any further. And my children are not going to see me behaving this way anymore. I'm not going to beat my wife anymore. I'm going to make she beat me. No, I mean, I'm not going to beat my wife anymore. I'm not going to allow perpetrate this characteristic. I'm going to change. I'm going to tell you, devil, that you don't own me. I belong to God. And so I gave you room by opening the store of anger, of wrath. I gave you room when I was molested. I gave you room when I was in my self-pity. I gave you room when they raped me. And I, I, I curse, I curse and I swear and I even curse God and gave you an open door. But I'm saying today, that my body is the temple of the living God. And I renounce your occupation and I command you to leave. You have to serve the devil eviction notice with immediate effect. And you do that until you're sure that every semblance of that enemy's hold is gone. Number seven, meditate on the word. So you will have good success, brethren. When you allow meditating the word, when we talk about meditation here, we're not talking about emptying your mind and allowing any spirit to come in and fill it. When we talk about meditating here, we're talking about putting the word in our minds and letting God gives us, give that word life in us and give us revelation in that word. Day and night, meditate on the word daily. Have a daily diet of the word. A daily, three meal you can eat three times a day eat the word three times a day so that you can become and grow in the word. Meditate on the word. Number eight, be quick to forgive, brethren. That's where the problem is with fester these things. Be quick to find people who have hurt you and just get it out, let it out. James 1 verse 19 to 20 says, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be what? Swift to hear. Slow to speak, slow to wrath. Colossians 3.13 says, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. You know what that forbearing means? Make room for the person's error and mistake. Forbearing means having known that the person is a possibility that they may still do it. I'm still going to give them forgiveness or a chance even though i know that they may still do it so forbearing one another and it's different from forgiving it's forgiving and forgiving and when you can't forgive anymore then you give grace that's forbearing forgive and forgive and when you can't forgive anymore you give grace and you know what grace is unmerited favor so colossians 3 verse 13 says forbearing one another and forgiving one another if any man have acquired against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Ephesians 4, verse 32, these two books that were circulated. And ye, and be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake forgave you. And the big one, let not the sun go down with thy wrath. Let not what? The sun. Go down with thy wrath. Ephesians 4, 26. Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Try settle the matter before you go to bed. As far as possible, try to settle the matter rather than carry it over, especially in relationship. When you said, yeah, yeah, you hurt me. I see you, I see you, you see you tomorrow. You know, when we were in school and, 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 and a guy troubled you, you say, all right, I'll see you Friday. I see a Friday because me and my big brother coming for you. Sometimes you don't even have a big brother. But, but, but we say that as a means of protection. But we're saying don't do that. 
don't keep something for tomorrow that can be dealt with today. Go to bed, resolving the issues. Talk it over. Elder Gotcha says he and his wife has never quarreled, but you could hear them talking for a long time loudly to each other. So you have to sort it out. Read it out. Talk it out. Let it out. And so that he can be healed. If you allow that fuss, that that foot, that sore to continue to fester, it's going to deteriorate. And as a matter of fact, they have a, a sickness I call a gang breach, where after a time, it take over the, the, the part of the body. And if you don't cut it off completely, you're going to poison it to death. You have to detach that old part. Don't let it reach that stage. Deal with it now. Matthew 5, and this is where I close. Matthew 5, 25 says, Agree with thine adversary quickly while thou art in the way with him. This at any time the adversary deliver thee to judge, and the judge to deliver thee to the officer, and thou be cast into prison. That's where anger and wrath leave us into judges. Bring us before the court, the court. Bring us before the officer. Bring us before the prison officer. Bring us to jail and bring us to hell. So, Proverbs 29, 11. Fool give full vent to their rage, but wise bring calm in the end. Fools give vent to their rage, but wise bring calm in the end. God bless you. Um, Ella Russell, we will take it from here. Praise the Lord. Thank you so much for that, Elder. And I think, you know, you have given us a roadmap to do the things that will help us to overcome wrath this morning. I know a lot has been up there, but just take your time. You take what is for you. I'm taking what is for me because the roadmap here is to acquire good coping skills the coping skills that you have now with your wrath is not the will of god because as we have learned that being angry does not work the will of god we can't allow that to fester this morning and to we have to put this thing to bed we have to acquire good coping skills your coping skills cannot be to perpetrate the abuse the coping skills that you have cannot be to malice the coping skills that you have cannot need. I'm going to injure you. I'm going to do you harm. Ella Edwards, take his time and outline in a spiritual path. You, you might have to build on it. You might have to do something with it. You know, get get help, get, you know, some form of help and counseling or what have you. But we have given you a roadmap to build on. And you need new coping skills. And the coping skills that you're having right now is not it. You can't be abusing your children. You can't be rejecting your, your, your loved ones. You cannot be shouting and yelling at, at all the time. Those are not good coping skills. It will give you blood, high blood pressure. It will give you it will give you all kind of sickness, as the elder once just pointed out. So acknowledge that you have it, that you have that, that condition. Confess it to God. Pray, pray, pray. Surrender to God. Get help. Renounce the stronghold. That means you're going to tear it down, pull it down. Praise God and destroy. Meditate. Be quick to forgive. And don't let disagreement fester. That is how you're going to start to build your coping skills. That when somebody hurts you, you don't go and go with revenge you're going to talk about it and talk through your feelings and say you know what this is and and all kind of scenario can present itself but one thing we can tell you this morning and god bless you as we close that co using wrath as a coping skill in your relationship is not the way to go so god bless you god keep you pray for us amen praise god we mean well Elder Edward and I, in Jesus' name, and we thank God for you giving us your ears this morning to listen 
to what God has to say. God bless you. Over to you, um, prophetess, or who's going to take over. God bless you. Mighty God, hallelujah. Wow, we have been placed on the surgical table this morning. Mighty God, we are on the surgical table in the presence of God. Let's come in the room and say, Lord, do what you have to do to me on the surgical table this morning. We are in the surgical room. My cover, oh, do what you gotta do. Do what you gotta do. Lord of God, hallelujah, what a word. This morning, some people, if you use coping skills, see at work very late, say I'm working late. Don't need to work late enough. But you stay in the office till night. Don't go home to your family. She's a coping skill. And God knows a lie you tell him. Mighty God say so you have to work later. You stay at the office till night. You leave work and go spend some time with a friend. And talk and talk and talk. Coping skill. Wrong move. Till you go to your mother to five hours. You go to your father to two hours. You go to your auntie for three hours. Come home late to the family. No dinner not cook. Nothing not done. Coping skill. Mighty God, so why you say I go on a vacation? You go every one week, then you come back. Next time I go for three months, then six months. So till your family separate, and you don't go away, don't come back again. You just migrate. Mighty God. Hallelujah. Yeah. So the children left to suffer. The wife and the husband to separate. Children, children going through stress. Mother God, Father God. Then father, my father said, all right, me I go away too. Mighty God, you go to a different country. Then she made them leave alone. Headache can pay and can study, can't pass exam, nothing can happen for them. She even life God in a rare coping skill. Say the coping skill. Ma she came, I'm a master told ya. Take a job in another parish. Say the coping skill. I can't bother with this. I go and get a job in St. Mary. I live in Kingston. Ma she came, I'm a master told ya. She never sat on my sofa, but stop it, stop it. My God, it was man. They call Rama Basike, na kundu siki, da kundu seke, da basip on a friend house. See, I'm a stay up my friend this evening, coping skill, and don't go home. Mighty God, Hallelujah! I stay up my mother tonight. I'm a father, I'm a sister, I'm a auntie. Mighty God, don't go home. Ira basi kora basi, don't go home. Coping skills, they don't go home. Come and do my worship. I say, I must not do that. I will not do that no more, Jesus. I won't I must not do that. I will not do that. I will not do not do that. I Every night you go to church, coping skill, church keeping. You have to go to choir practice, choir meeting, Bible study. You have to go to this um, praise team, dance, dance worship, praise team worship, um, um, speech choir. Everything you have to go. Every night you go to church, leave your husband. Every night you go to church, leave your wife and your children. Every day you come from school, work, you will go to church. And no time for the family. You didn't get to go to the family person. So you use this question and wisdom, which night is more important to you to go to church. You can't go to church every night. I don't think that is right. Um, um, Minister, can you tell me something about that? Barang? Tell me if you're wrong. You're, you're a male. Tell me. You're a male minister. Tell me. No, no, prophetess. You're absolutely right. And, you know, when we talk about coping skills, amen, you are using some right terminology because people will use, that's how they cope, you know. And I've heard many husbands the, the wife gone and she's not in the home and you know um 
you know, as you said, dinner and cook, and it's not, that would be sexist and said the woman have to cook the food. But what they want was he, he wants his wife to be helping with the children, helping with preparing the food, helping to take care of the house, and she's not in the home. And we know about that. We're not we're not throwing no woman under the bus. We're just saying what the truth is, right? We're saying what the prophetess is saying is true, and it caused a lot of fissures to occur in marriages because I have heard many men say, Ella Russell, she not, she not, she not the woman. So what, 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 and, and a marriage, I don't have a marriage because she's never at home. She gone and instead she gone to cook for church and our house don't have no food, not cooking no food at our home. But she gone to church to cook and the man look at that and you can see that. She gone and you have to understand this, that your ministry is your family. You know, is God first, your family is second, and the church work come third. I know a lot of people gonna get upset with me today. God first, your family come second, and the church work come third because you going you going go to church and take care of church business, church work business, and your family is suffering. Come on now, we need to do better. Go ahead. Um, I think I think that um. We have to have that balance. We have to have that balance. You, you, you can't just go to the extreme. If you, if you decided that you wanted to pray 24 hours, you don't need to be married. You know, so pray for the Lord. The Lord said you'll have time for him. But if you are married, you have to spend time, share the time. You have to find time for your husband. You have to find time for your family. You have to find time for the Lord. But the Lord expects us to bring balance to all aspects of our life. We can't just focus on one. And I, I, I know of relationships that are affected because the husband is saying, well, she's always spring. And if she's always spring, then what else happened? And that's, that's not how God intended it to be. There must be balance. Say balance. There must be balance. There must be balance. There must be balance. If your husband is sick at home, don't pick up yourself, go to church to clean the church. Take care of your husband first. And if you have to stay home with him, that's still ministry. You're not doing the Lord nor hurt if you have to stay home and didn't attend to your family's need and miss a service or miss something that you have to do at church. Balance, balance, balance. And to build on that, we talk about the woman, the men too. Take care of your wife. You can't run to with every friend will call you. You're going wrong, go do this. Hey. You're going to help him do that. You're going to help the men. Men, 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 you need to be in the home to give guidance to your children. So don't figure that is a woman alone must do this. Men, you husband out there, you are talking to you. Stop run up and down with the other friends. Stop going and say, oh, we have a, we have a men's night. Because she, no, no, stay home with your family. Take care of your family, right? Because when your children don't see you, that becomes an issue for them. Men, when they don't see them father in the home, the, they are going to have other coping skill that is going to be toxic in their own relationship. You don't want that to happen, men. Take care of your house. Take care of your wife. Oh, take care of your children. Right? If they're sick, if your wife's sick, as, as Ella Edwards said, see him go for the men. If your wife's sick, no, 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 church. If you have to preach that morning, call upon that minister and say, look here, my wife's sick, you know. I mean, not leaving her alone in the bed. So you so find somebody to preach. Yeah, I saw it have to do it. Because if my wife's sick, guess what? Somebody else would have to teach this morning because Ella Russell is not going to appear. Because I have to take care of my wife. I have to take care of my husband. I have to take care of my children. Deal with your family, brethren. Your family. Your family. Deal with them first. And then you can look to church work. I know some people will get upset with that. God first. It's your family and then church work. Ella was to say, you might not invite me back, but God bless you in Jesus' name. But take care of your family because your family will mash up and go to hell and church still will continue. Jesus of mercy. Amen, amen. Amen. Go ahead, uh, prophetess, over to you. Amen. I think it's secret all this morning. Nobody still to be fully our understanding. As we go, the, what, the, the next thing we want to talk about, um, 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 a pastor. Uh, I, I have a question for Elder Russell because 
And I'm sorry to butt in, but I, I really want to ask him. So I'm not going to play the devil's advocate, but I'm going to be. It's a word that um Ella Gladson used once. I can't remember what it is right now. But I'm not the devil's advocate. But you said something just now that has hit a chord with me. And from I've been a teenager, it's been a concern of mine. If a family is first, and, you know, then, you know, well, God, family, church, and everything else. Do you think that, or how do I want to worry? Let me just say it. Why is it then that in our churches, and I won't call any denomination or anything, but right across the board, every public holiday, there is a service. So when do we have family time if yeah. every public holiday there's always a service, every single one of them? Where do we have family time? True, true. Very good question. And and Ella Edwards can jump in as well as prophetess. Yes, very excellent question. That there is a time. Ecclesiastes tell us there's a time under the sun for everything, right? We have church, 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 church. Yeah, and that's great and that's good. But what Ella Edwards said earlier, balance. We need to come yeah. to balance with everything that we do. But some people counter, we have a counterbalance because church way up there, so our family on the here. So our family we up there, so in the church underneath here. So there has to be a balance. So you're right, pastors. Bishops out there, Ella Russell that say, you're right. Um, Evangelist started to raise that point. Why, when we have Labor Day, which is a public holiday, or um, there's a holiday coming up in May in Jamaica. I, I forgot the holiday. We normally have a holiday in, uh, that come up. In, That's in, Labor in, Day. Labor Day, right. Why, when we have Labor Day, we can't just say, you know, we're going to stay with the family and have some 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 um get together around Labor Day with my family, whether we're going to so, some things in the morning in with the house and then in the evening with us chill. We can go to we can go to feed. Nothing around for go to to um Don't River Fall with your family, you know. And you have a family trip with your your brothers or your sisters or your husband or your wife or your children, them because Ella Russell usually do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sister Russell and I on a Saturday morning, we're gone to 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 Don't River Falls with, with Judine, with Diana, and with Jay. You know, my children, them, right? You don't have to have every you don't have to have an activity. We're going to call fasting. Oh my god. Yes, it sounds spiritual and we're going to have fasting on that day. No. No, you can't say stay home take, and spend time with your family. Use the time to spend time with your family. So you're absolutely right. You, we don't have to have a, a church a church event on every holiday that we get. Because that is the time some people, the one time some people get time off from work to stay home and they would have liked to stay home for the family. But you put an order, an edict out there. If you don't come to church, this and that, that, that. So you have to come to church. Come on, man. Leave the people them. Let them grow with them family. Let them enjoy. Let them do what they want to do with that, that their time. It's their time. It's their time. So leave them. Leave them, Bridget. Pastors, just look into that a little bit. Because let them spend time with them children. You call it even be a single mother or a single father. Being a single mother or a single father, have time with your children. See me, carry them to Hope Garden. And if you see them at Hope Garden, uh, don't come and say, you should have their church, you know. So why you do, why, why you have, why you never do a church? Why you do a Hope Garden too? If you are point for them, I say, you should have their church. Why you never do a church too? Leave the brother and the sister. Leave the single parent then. Have time with your family. And pastors, look into that. Let people spend time because the devil a mash up. The devil in the church is creating a mess with our family because we have things, we have things uneven, you know, we're not coming to balance. So the devil having a feast in the church with our family. You know much, you know which marriage is on the rock? It not come to pass yet. It not come to the fore yet. You know how much, um, um, children going astray and ain't not come up yet. The devil is running through the church and running through our family because we don't we don't teach and we don't let people understand that it's not about all about church work. It's not all about church work. God is interested in our family. He wants our family to succeed, ladies and gentlemen. 
God has given us a tool to let our family succeed. Prayer and fasting is part of it, but also recreation. You know what it says? Recreation is not sin. It's not sin to have recreation with your family. And some some churches would probably, I'm not calling no names, some churches would think that if you, if you go play football with your son or go play a netball with your daughter and have a little daughter, mother, daughter time or a little, you know, a little time with your father, you sin because you should be at church and pray and read the Bible. Come on, man. No. In Jesus. You know, no, I want to share a testimony, um, prophetess. Um, oh, go ahead. Netball plus two shots. Because you, you, can't, you can't play netball the lunges. So I don't know you're going to play netball. The netball close to a shot. I should be in that shot to us play netball. Is it at a knee? Is that like a scar skirt? <laughs> so you can't play netball. <laughs> Providence, I want to share a testimony. And I'm going to be very transparent as I always do. I want to help somebody this morning. So Elder, when I was young and I was youth president, you know, I was so, you know, as, you know, as I say, you're, you're so excited and the zeal and church and everything is church and always church. And I had my daughter. And do you know that couple times, well, I ended up at church moderating youth service and making sure everything was fine and forgot that my daughter was at school and forgot to pick her up. No, it's not a joke. It's serious. Um, several times. Several times. And there were other things. I would miss. She loves dancing. And I would miss her dance recitals. Because I had to be at a church service or a church function and stuff. And one day she said something, man. And I'm telling you. I couldn't hit her. I couldn't do nothing because it hit her nerve. And I recognize if I continue down this path, I am going to lose my daughter. And she's going to despise church and despise ministry. And when she started high school, I had to make a decision that I am going to be intentional about supporting the things that she loves and presenting myself as a living sacrifice at events. So whenever I couldn't really attend the event, it must be that it was something that like, oh my goodness. And I sat her down and I said, I cannot make it. But most times, sometimes I go and I say, I cannot stay the whole time, but I'm coming and I'm leaving or I'm going to come late. But I make sure I was there. You know, when it was like time for every every September, you have orientation. I make sure I was there. So I had to change. I had to change because I recognized that I was about to lose her. And, you know, a lot of people come in and say, oh, you have a beautiful relationship with your daughter. I know they want that relationship. But I said, yeah, but I had to put in the work. I had to regain her trust. I had to spend time with her. I had to be intentional about building that relationship. Now that my daughter is older and has gone off to college, you know what has happened? And the Lord brought it to me and I want to share it with somebody. I don't have to say to her or beg her to go to church and she's at college. I don't have to beg her to have a relationship with God and she's at college. Because what I did was that I changed myself to fit into her life and build a relationship with her and then brought her into my thing and then try not to leave her out. So like sometimes even when I was going overseas to minister, I would take her with me. So she could feel a part of, and she could, you know, build that relationship because many times when they get to 18, they don't want to go to church anymore. And they don't want to God and them just done because we didn't spend any time with them. We didn't invest with them. We don't have no relationship with them. We don't have no with them. We don't know what's going on in them. Like we don't know if them like girls. We don't know if them like boys. We don't, we don't have a no relationship with them because we're not spending time with them. So I want to say to somebody this morning, if that's, if that's you, and you're on the wrong path, change. It's not too late to change. And it's not too late to go around and build a relationship with your children. It's very important that you do that. And Evangelist Tada, let me just remind some people who might just come on how we get here, because the Holy Ghost used your mom a while ago to speak about coping skills. One of yes. the, one, and one of the coping skills she was pulling out was that 
you know, you don't want to go home because of the, what happening there and we don't want to trash it out. We don't want to speak through our issues at home. So we find auntie home, we find mother home, we find um, uncle home, all kind of other home, friend house, every, and church, and we stay at church, and we stay at work late because we use that as a coping skill not to go home to see the spouse to work out whatever situation that is there. So that's how we end up here, talking about spending time with family, because we use different things to cope when we are angry or when we don't want to talk through things or when we don't want to see the person instead of you know trying to trash it out, we find other people house to go. And with children, for those who, for us who have children, whether they are a single parent, whether, they are, um, whether you're married, our children suffer. And that's how we end up start talking about that we need family time, more family time, and we don't use all of the holidays to have a church service, you know. And 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 when you and if you are a worker at the church, and we set the order, and I still go repeat it: God first, God, God is the head of our life and the head of our family. The family comes second, church work come third. Over to you, prophetess. Amen. Very well said. You can go back to YouTube and listen to the message. Mighty God, we're going to pray. Amen. Mighty God, we are going to first repent for not having good coping skill in our life, for the things that we do, and we are all guilty of it. We have to ask God forgiveness. Or we are all guilty for God of all these bad coping skills that we use in our life daily. In the presence of God. Mighty God, we are going. The Bible says, either cover this sin, shall not prosper. Mighty God, we want to prosper this morning. We want to tell God to forgive us. So let's come in, woman, and ask forgiveness for all the bad coping skills that we use. We have heard them from the apostle this morning. Let's come and ask God forgiveness. Come in, let us all pray. so much just your word is my I you are worthy Jesus, <laughs> 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 <laughs>